Well, good evening. Welcome to Sunday night. Um, tonight we're going to continue in our quest to summarize uh, each of the 66 books of the Bible. So open up your Bible to the book of Jonah. But before we start, let's ask for Yahweh's blessing for our time in his word. Father, thank you for life. Thank you for eternal life. It is your grace that you've given to us. It's all of you, for you, by you, and through you. And we thank you, Father, for the gift of understanding that you give to us through your Holy Spirit that draws us to your word, desires more of you each and every time we open up your word. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So the book of Jonah is the fifth of the so-called minor prophets. Jonah is referred to as a minor prophet, not because the, of the insignificance of its message, but because it's only 48 verses in length. One author states that the book of Jonah is a case study of missed blessings because so many readers focus upon its supposed difficulties rather than upon its rich teachings. So it is my hope tonight that as we go through the book of Jonah that we might focus on three things. Number one, the basic elements of spiritual truth. To realize that this message is for all generations, including ours, and to recognize its depiction of the character of God and his purposes. Even though the message of Jonah is a brief message, it is not less important than the major prophets. No word from God is any less important than any other word from God. Jonah, however, is the one minor prophet that everybody knows about because of his amazing character in, the, in this story. One commentator says this about Jonah, backward, grudging, recalcitrant, racist. You would have thought that God would just chuck him and get somebody else, but God doesn't do that, end of quote. So before we look at the setting, the background, and the characters of this book, let me remind you, this is not a story about a fish. The fish is only a minor part of the story, mentioned in only three verses. So let's talk about Jonah. Who is Jonah? Jonah was a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel. Jonah was from Gath, Hefer, in the territory of Zebulun, in the northern kingdom, and he prophesied during the time of King Jeroboam II, which was from 793 B.C. to 753 B.C. We first hear about Jonah as described in 2 Kings 14.25, and you don't have to go there. Uh, I'll read it to you. He restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath as far as the sea of the, of the Arabah, according to the word of Yahweh, the God of Israel, which he spoke through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was of Gath Hefer. The designation of Lebo Hamath as Israel's norm, norm, northern border makes the new boundary equal to that that was established by Solomon. It is noteworthy because it gives insight to what was going on in the Gentile nations of Assyria and Syria. Both nations, both Assyria and Syria, were located along the west and northern borders of the northern kingdom and had been aggressors against Israel. But under Jeroboam II, Israel was gaining back these territories. 2 Kings 14.25 tells us he restored the border attained by King Solomon. So according to Assyrian records, Assyria's, Assyria's trouble during this time, troubles were aggravated by famine, in 765 and 759 BC, and some say in the years in between, and the internal revolts that occurred in 763, 760, and 746 BC, all of which ex explained the increasing helplessness of the Assyrian monarchs. <clears throat> 
One author states, 36 years, 781 to 745 BC, Assyria was practically paralyzed. It was observed that even the central provinces maintained only a tenuous loyalty to Assyria for the various governors ruled by virtual independence. This could explain the title, the king of Nineveh, in chapter Jonah, Jonah chapter 3, verse 6, rather than the king of Assyria found elsewhere. Nineveh was at this time virtually the extent of that king's domain. All of this was according to the word of Yahweh spoken through Jonah prior to him being told to go to Nineveh. As we unfold the events of the book of Jonah, please remember Jonah's contribution in reestablishing the boundaries of the northern kingdom under the reign of King Jeroboam II. But of course, it was all by God's design. Jonah had been a contributor to the favorable economic and political conditions of the northern kingdom during that time. So what do we know about Nineveh? Nineveh was the capital of Assyria and perhaps the largest city in the ancient world at that time. It was reported to have a population of 600,000 people. Nineveh was situated on the eastern bank of the Tigris River opposite the modern city of Mosul north of the city of Zab, both of which are in modern-day Iraq. It, it, it was an old city dating back to approximately 4500 BC and one of the principal cities of ancient Assyria. According to Genesis 10:11, the city was built by the great hunter Nimrod and Nimrod was the great-grandson of Noah. Nineveh was infamous for its cruelty and was his and a historical nemesis of both Israel and Judah. So what did Jonah know about Assyria and its capital, Nineveh? He knew of their wickedness. They massacred their enemies. They mutilated their captives. They were known to dismember and decapitate and burn people alive. Jonah knew of their gory forms of torture which marked their behavior toward their enemies. He knew that Assyria had posed for a very long time a clear and present danger to the national security of Israel. So what do we know about the author of this book? The book makes no direct reference to who the author is and throughout the book Jonah is referred to in the third person. However, it is not unusual, an unusual practice for the uh, Old Testament. It seems to be clear as to who the author is because of the first-hand autobiographical description of the unusual events and experiences. The detailed information included clearly points to Jonah as the author. So let's start in chapter 1 and read the first five verses. The word of Yahweh came to Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of Yahweh. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of Yahweh. Yahweh hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laid down and fallen sound asleep. So the book of Jonah begins with God's revelation to the prophet Jonah. The phrase, the word of Yahweh, is mentioned seven times in this book. And according to the text, we don't know the exact way that God communicated with Jonah because God spoke, chose to speak to prophets in diverse ways. In many occasions, God spoke through dreams or visions. And at other times, he spoke with them more directly. We don't know much about Jonah's life, but we do know that he was living in dark and difficult times. However, prior to being chosen to go to Nineveh, 
Jonah appeared to have enjoyed some spiritual privileges in speaking God's word to the king, to King Jeroboam II, concerning the restoration of the borders once established by King Solomon. To help us better understand Jonah's journey with God, we need to keep these spiritual moments in mind. Early in Jonah's life as a prophet, he enjoyed with King Jeroboam II many victories to regain territories lost to many of their neighbors. This was an economically and politically prosperous time for Israel, but however, not spiritually. We must remember Jonah was God's servant, called to advance God's kingdom through obedience to his will. As a servant prophet, Jonah had been set apart by God for a unique purpose. God speaks through Amos about his servants, the prophets. Amos 3, 7 says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. Jonah belonged to a privileged group of men who stood in the presence of God and felt the pressure of the Spirit of God on their hearts and conscience. The prophets heard God's unmistakable voice telling them that he, what he was about to do among the nations. Every prophet knew of God's purpose for each one of them. Sinclair Ferguson says, it is characteristic of such men that they are deeply conscious of a sense of destiny. But Ferguson also notes, few things are more important for the Christian than to have conscious sense of God's destiny. What is important is that we have some sense of what we are. This knowledge ought to be one of the great motivating forces in our lives. It was this question that drew Esther to do what God had made for her. Esther 4.16 says, And thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. So let's move on to the text. Verse 1, we see the phrase, The word of Yahweh came to Jonah. This is a common expression in the way that God spoke to prophets. One author says, this phrase was used over a hundred times in the book, books of the prophets and it indicates that it meant to be a prophet or what it meant to be a prophet. It meant to be the recipient of a communication from God, a word which contained a message. It meant to have a clear, fresh light shed upon oneself or society or nations by the living God. It meant to be drawn into God's presence to see things from his perspective. The prophets often described the sharpness of such an encounter. It was a sword to their spirits, a burden on their shoulders, a hammer breaking their rocky hearts, a fire raging within them. It was bitter to taste. It came. It could not be halted. And it forced itself on them unbidden. It gripped their minds and touched their consciences. It impelled their emotions. They could not escape the certain assurance that the voice of God was sounding in their hearts and must now sound to others through their lips. It has been well said that our problem in obeying God is not that we do not understand what he is saying, but that we do. In verse 2, God is giving Jonah two imperatives. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. This is, this is a command that is firm, clear, represents a sense of urgency, and it gives Jonah a heavy responsibility. Jonah was giving traveling orders, and the destination was Nineveh. Again, to help us better understand Jonah's reaction to Yahweh's directive is to go to Nineveh and his directive to go to Nineveh and cry against it, we must remember this task is very unique. Yahweh's other prophets ministered primarily within the borders of Judah and Israel. 
Judah in the southern kingdom and Israel in the northern kingdom. They ministered inside the borders, but they gave prophecies and declarations directed at the nations surrounding them. Jonah, on the other hand, was being sent out of his nation to go to Nineveh, which was unusual for a prophet to leave either Judah or Israel. Jonah ministered in the northern kingdom. He knew the threat of the Assyrians, and he hated them. So why was Jonah asked to leave his home and go to Nineveh? Well, in verse 2, God said, Their wickedness has come up before me. One commentary says this about God's actions towards Nineveh. While all sin is abhorrent to God, in some instances, a special group of people had become so wicked that God issued a special call of, of localized judgment. So it was with Nineveh. Nineveh. Archaeology confirms the biblical witness to the wickedness of the Assyrians. They were well known in the ancient world for brutality and cruelty. Jonah's reluctance to travel to Nineveh may have been due to their infamous violence. And as we see later on, there was another fear haunting Jonah. Verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of Yahweh. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish from the presence of Yahweh. So let's take a look at the map. Um, I think it's been up there for quite a long time. Um, it's a map of uh, the ancient Near East in Jonah's time. And you've probably already found Assyria and then Nineveh, but do you see Tarshish on the map? Well, there's an arrow pointed off to the west. It is nowhere to be found because it's over 2,000 miles from Joppa. In the opposite direction of Nineveh, Jonah made the decision instead of traveling the approximately 500 miles northeast of Palestine to Nineveh that he would board the ship in Joppa, the nearest seaport, with the intent to go to Tarshish. Tarshish was a port in Gibraltar, which is located on the coast of Spain, some 2,000 miles due west. Jonah's reaction is to run in the opposite direction of Nineveh to flee as far away as he can possibly go. So from what we already know about Nineveh, we can understand why Jonah might want to go there, might not want to go there. He clearly wants nothing to do with going to Nineveh or preaching to the Ninevites. But the truth of the matter is that by fleeing, he's declaring his unwillingness to obey or to serve God. This is nothing less than rebellion against God's sovereignty. However, According to what we have read so far in the book of Jonah, we are given no clue at this point why Jonah chose to act so foolishly. While the issue of personal safety may have been a factor, it certainly was not the predominant one. The reason for Jonah's disobedience in flight, while not given in this verse, is explicitly stated by the author in chapter 4, verse 2. I'll read it to you. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. The issue was fear for Jonah. And not just fear of the, Ninev uh, of the Ninevites and their cruelty, but also fear that the Ninevites might repent and be spared the disaster they deserved. So there's a quote by John MacArthur. He says, Jonah didn't want anything to do with the Assyrians, and amazingly, he didn't want the Assyrians to repent. Now, when you don't want people to repent, that's deep-seated hatred. Hatred. 
He didn't want to take the message of hope. He didn't want to take the message of forgiveness. He didn't want to take a message of grace to these hated pagan enemies, a civilization of murdering terrorists, violent annihilators of everyone who stood in their path. He wanted God to judge them. He wanted God to destroy them. He had an aggressive hatred toward these people. End of quote. Read again with me verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of Yahweh. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of Yahweh. Verse 3 sets up the rest of Jonah's story. In verses 4, of four and 5, we see the first of ten miracles performed by God in this book. Yahweh hurled a great wind on the sea. There was a great storm on the sea so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid and every man cried to his God and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, lain down and fallen sound asleep. So I just have a question. How tired do you have to be in order to sleep through a situation where the ship is being tossed and thrown in every direction and was about to be torn apart. Apparently Jonah thought he could just walk away from a divine assignment, but Yahweh was to make Jonah's voyage a teachable moment, one for all to remember, and he didn't back down from using Jonah to complete his mission. The book of Jonah displays God's sovereign rule over man and all, all of creation. The plans of a sovereign God are not easily thwarted. Psalm 24 verses 1 and 2, you don't have to go there, the, says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Jonah had to know that the eyes of Yahweh were continually upon him. Proverbs 15.3 tells us the eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. What a picture of contrast. The wind, the sea, and even the ship were tuned in to the Lord's purposes, but not Jonah. Verse 4. Yahweh hurled a great wind on the sea and there was a great storm on the sea so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid and every man cried to his God. How intense was this storm and why were the sailors so afraid? Well, first of all, we must remember or be reminded that the sailors were experienced and accustomed to storms on the sea. But know this storm was different and they knew it too. Perhaps it was the suddenness that the storm occurred in it, or the intensity of the wind, but it gave the sailors an uneasy feeling so that they were prompted to each cry out to his God. The storm's frightening intensity along with the sailors' frantic activities was in stark contrast to Jonah's state. He had gone below deck, literally into the inmost part of the ship as far away from God and his duty as he could possibly go. Jonah went into a deep sleep which is described as to have been the same root as the sleep experienced by Adam in Genesis 2.21. So Yahweh caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the, f the flesh at that place. Whatever the cause of Jonah's deep sleep, he was oblivious to the intensity of the storm. So let's look at verses 6 through 13. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Get up. Call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots so we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us now, 
On whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? Where did you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, How could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of Yahweh because he had told them. So they said to him, What should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea has, was becoming increasingly stormy. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that on the account of me this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rowed desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even more stormy against them. Verse 9 in the first, is the first time that Jonah speaks. He speaks to the sailors with a short response and with one he knew that they would understand. I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And now they know this man is disobeying the Lord God of heaven. So what did they ask Jonah? What should we do to you that the storm may become calm for us? And Jonah says to them, pick me up, throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on the account of me, this great storm has, become, has come upon you. Jonah's response was not one of repentance, but only a solution to the raging storm. The sailors were reluctant to throw him overboard, as we see in verse 13, that the, man, the men desperately rowed to return to the land, but it was to no avail. The storm got progressively, progressively worse. Verses 14 through 16. Then they called on Yahweh and said, We earnestly pray, O Yahweh, do not let us perish on the account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us. For you, O Yahweh, have done us, have done as you pleased. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared Yahweh greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made vows. Now, doesn't this just amaze you? The sailors earnestly called on Yahweh to pardon them from this peril and, and to not credit the death of Jonah to their account. We don't know the full extent of what happened, but it appears that when Jonah explained to them who God was, they listened and understood. And then, when they saw the demonstration of the miraculous ceasing of the storm, they believed that this was the one true God. They knew that their false gods could not do miracles. They had never seen anything like this before. They became believers in the message that Jonah gave them. No one knows for sure, but we may meet these sailors in heaven someday. Verse 17, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. To help us understand what happened in verse 17, we must first look at the word appointed. It means ordained or prescribed by God. The word is used four times in the book of Jonah and always points to Yahweh's power to accomplish his will. Here it shows his sovereignty over the creatures of the sea. And in chapter 6, it shows his power over the, or in chapter 4, verse 6, it shows his power over plants. In chapter 4, verse 7, it, it shows his power over crawling creatures. And in 4, 8, it shows his power over the wind. While God indeed may have prepared a special fish for Jonah, the text only indicates that God summoned the fish common or special, to be in that place at the exact moment of need. We see another miracle by, by Yahweh in that he created a fish large enough for a man to survive in its stomach and that Jonah was able to stay alive for three days inside the fish. Now the Bible doesn't have too many details of what it was like to be alive inside the fish for three days. But 
um, let's think about what it might have been like. Well, first of all, there was absolutely no light. I can imagine it was wet and clammy. Maybe a suffocating stench. Exposure to digestive acids eating at your skin. Exposure to other stuff that might be in the fish's stomach. Exposure to a constant motion of the fish and the changing pressure of ocean depths. I don't know about you, but the constant motion would do me in. I can't even watch my grandkids swing on a swing without getting dizzy. So for me, this would be an absolutely nauseating experience. But remember, the fish was prepared for Jonah. Now we come to chapter 2, which begins with a significant change in Jonah. Verses 1 and 2 state that then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish, and he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. You heard my voice. Jonah had finally come to his senses and realized what had just happened. He acknowledged his circumstances and realized that his life was being sustained by God and that he was being disciplined by God. Jonah prayed to the Lord his God and God answered Jonah. In verse 2, the term Sheol is used and can be referred to with certainty that in Hebrew, the term referred to here is as the grave, a place of the dead. Jonah here is describing his experience as being at the very brink of death. In verse 3, Jonah says, For you had cast me into the deep, all your breakers and billows passed over me. One author says this about verse 3. Jonah does not say the waves and the billows of the sea went over me, but thy waves and thy billows, because he felt in his conscience that the sea, with its waves and billows, was the servant of God and of his wrath to punish sin. Listen to Jonah's expression of despair and also hope in verses 4 through 6. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Yahweh, my God. Some commentators believe that this, the phrase roots of the mountains refers to the foundation of the mountains which lie in the depths of the earth and are covered by the sea. This, along with Jonah's statement, the earth with its bars was around me forever, would indicate that he seems to be expressing his feeling of being in the deepest part of the ocean and no possible way to get out. The last line in verse 6, But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Yahweh, my God. It, this is the turning point of Jonah's prayer. Here again, Jonah is expressing praise and worship to his God, the sovereign God of the universe, who has shown him such compassionate grace. This again is a work of a God, of God to change the heart of the prophet Jonah. Jonah's called out, called out in his distress to the Lord and he answered him. There's no specific request in Jonah's prayer, but there's a desperate cry. And what was the message of Jonah's prayer? Well, it's worship and praise to God for his ways and that God is Jonah's only hope. And he makes a commitment to God in verses 9, 7 through 9. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving that which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. If you save me out of this, Lord, I will serve you. I will keep my promise to you 
the vow that I made to you when I confessed you as my Lord and my God. Out of this suffocating and unimaginable circumstance comes this amazing prayer. The man who once recoiled at the thought of God extending mercy to, to Assyria now knows that his only hope is in the goodness of God toward him. Jonah is now seeking a God of grace, compassion, mercy, and loving kindness. And God, true to form, graciously answers his prayer. Verse 10, the Lord commands the fish and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. One author says, this was a special, there was a special reason God held him under, the, these terrible, uh, under this terrible experience. Jonah needed to feel the grace of God towards him before he would be a suitable minister to the people of Nineveh. God was fitting him uniquely for work in Nineveh, end of quote. So moving on to chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. Did you notice the words at the beginning of chapter 3 are very similar to those that are stated in chapter 1? However, Jonah is not the same person he was at the beginning of chapter 1. Jonah has survived a near-death experience and has learned many lessons in that experience. While Jonah had taken quite a detour since the first command, God's will remained unchanged. Verse 1 says that God's word came to Jonah a second time, and it should be noted because there are examples in Scripture which show that not everyone has a second chance to do what God has commanded. In verse 2, we see God's kindness and patience with Jonah in that there is no mention of reproach for the prophet's former disobedience. The Lord simply repeated his command. The message here simply points to God's sovereignty and his insistence upon the accomplishment of his will. It is very clear where Jonah is to go, what he is to do, and what is the source of his message. So Jonah arose, went to Nineveh, according to the word, this is verse 3, word of Yahweh. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. So one of the first things we notice is the obedience of Jonah in verse 3 compared to his disobedience in chapter 1. Another item to take note of from verses 2 and 3 is that Yahweh describes Nineveh as an exceedingly great city, and as the great city. It is also referred to in chapter 4, verse 11, as the great city. By these descriptions, one could interpret that it was a very important city to Yahweh. Nineveh was approximately 500 miles northeast of Joppa, where Jonah boarded the ship to go to Tarshish, the city was about 60 miles in circumference with walls that were 100 feet high. The walls were thick enough that three chariots could be rowed abreast on the top of the walls. Nineveh was a much larger city than the city of Babylon and the population was known to be approximately 600,000. So why, why is this noteworthy? Because God's heart was going out to every inhabitant of the city. Clearly, God cared deeply about the Ninevites who he had created in his, him, in his image. At the end of verse 3, we see the phrase that also describes Nineveh, a three days walk. Because it was an ancient practice, Jonah most likely met the leaders in Nineveh on the first day and then traveled to various sections of the city over the next two days, Jonah needed to share God's message with all of Nineveh. Thus, he would need to speak to as many groups as possible. And because of this, Jonah's visit to Nineveh was more than likely a three-day event. Verse 4, Then Jonah began to go through the city one, city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Overthrown. 
the word overthrown is the same word used to describe the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. God is threatening to destroy Nineveh even down to its foundations, just as he had done with Sodom and Gomorrah. Also, a one day's walk would be the amount of time it would take to travel from one end of the city to the other, which is about 20 miles. Most commentators would agree that in the Hebrew, the message was only five words long. While it was not clear what this was, all he had, if this was all he had to say, the text does suggest that God's message was brief and that Jonah simply preached it repeatedly. If these words were the total of the message, there was no reason given for the destruction, nor was the manner of destruction described, and there was not even an explicit call for repentance. The warning was a message of grace. Nineveh, Nineveh was being granted 40 days to repent and turn to God from their wicked ways. And why 40 days? Well, to answer that, I've got four passages to read through with you. Genesis 7, 17, Then the flood came upon the earth for 40 days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. Exodus 24, 18, Moses entered the midst of the cloud as he went up to the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. 1 Kings 19.8 So he, Elijah, arose and ate and drank and went in the strength that food, that food, 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount, mountain of God. And Matthew 4.2 And after he, Jesus, had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. The number 40 in Scripture is used as a period of testing. And Nineveh prevailed. Chapter 3, verse 5. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. That is a NASB translation. I think a better translation to re represent the meaning of this verse is in the ESV. It says, And the people of Nineveh believed God. Now, most of the world will probably tell us that they believe in God. But only a few are saved and can make the statement that we believe God. To give us an understanding of what is happening with Jonah and his days in Nineveh, let's go to Jesus' teaching in Luke 11, verses 29, 30, and 32. You can turn there if you want. Uh, I will read the passage. Um, as, this is verse 29, as the crowds were increasing, he began to say, he being Jesus, this generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. Then in verse 32, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. This is Jesus' teaching uh, in Luke. In verses 29 and 30, Jesus is referring to Jonah as a sign. Charles Feinberg, a Jewish author and commentator, describes what Jesus is saying in these passages. Our Lord said that Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites. The events in the book of Jonah had reached the people of Nineveh before the prophet arrived at the capital. Hence, he was a sign to them. They could see in Jonah that God punishes sin and spares the sinner on repentance. The sacred record preserves for us only five words of Jonah's message, but it was one of the greatest messages ever preached by a man, if not the greatest. Nowhere do we read in the Bible or outside of it that one message from a servant of God was used of God to so great an extent. 
for the whole city of Nineveh believed God. Nothing remotely approximating this has ever been taken into the history of revivals. Jonah was a sign, but the people did not concern themselves with the prophet. They believed God. End of quote. God had preceded Jonah's visit to Nineveh with the faith to believe, and Jonah was the sign that their faith was true. Everyone, young and old, turned to God, confessing and expressing grief over their sin. The response was spontaneous through Nineveh. No one waited to hear from the king or his nobles as to their command. As soon as the message reached their ears, there was immediate fear of God and repentance followed. What a miracle. It is also essential to know that Jonah bringing God's word has his message confirmed by the power of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of the Ninevites. All of Nineveh was given a broken and contrite heart. So let's read Nineveh's response in verses 6 through 9. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. He issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. All of Nineveh heard Jonah's message and in and an immediate fear struck their hearts. The fear that existed is best represented in the king's response in verse 9. God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. The king called for fasting, wearing of sackcloth, pleading with God, and turning from evil and violence. Verse 10. When God saw their deeds that they turned from their wicked way, that God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. It's interesting to note that all the deeds of the Ninevites, the fasting, the wearing of sackcloth, calling on God, and turning from evil, only the last one is mentioned as explicitly leading to God's relenting. God's compassionate heart is always sensitive to those who cry out seeking forgiveness. We see in the book of Jonah irrefutable evidence that God wishes not for the destruction of the sinner, but for redemption and reconciliation of all his creation. The story of repentance and the sparing of Nineveh in chapter 3 is a mirror of Jonah's own experience and is the story of every true believer. Only through God's miraculous intervention in the person of Jesus Christ is there any hope? So without knowing what unfolds in chapter 4, what would you think might happen next? You might say that the grace of God was made evident in the repentance of all of Nineveh and that they were no longer in danger of God's wrath and that Jonah was obedient and successful in his ministry. However, God's dealing with Jonah does not end there. One might say there is even a higher objective of the whole book, and that is God teaching his servant Jonah truths about the narrowness of his heart and about the endless grace that God gives to his children. As believers, we need to see and understand Jonah's heart so that we can see the attitude that may exist in our own so let's read Jonah's response in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to Yahweh and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Verse 2. 
The contrast in Jonah's attitude toward Nineveh's repentance versus God's attitude is something to take note of. Jonah had received God's pardoning mercy based on his repentance, but he was not willing to acknowledge the same for Nineveh. Jonah is like many of us today. We feel that we can manage God's world better than he can. Jonah is extremely angry because God, of God's pardoning grace to Nineveh. Jonah was more zealous about God's judgment on, the, on a wicked, perverse society than he, thought, than he thought of in sparing it with his grace. Jonah thought his plans for Nineveh was the proper course of action rather than sparing the great city. Just a quick thought. How many of us would like to see God's wrath inflicted upon the evils of this world that exist today rather than God's grace abounding? We must pray for our enemies. Now notice at the beginning of verse 2, he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, even though Jonah was angry, he was still a man of God reaching out to him in prayer. But he was clearly not praying in accordance with God's heart and his will, but according to his own desires. In the remaining portion of verse 2, Jonah is explaining to Yahweh that this is what he most feared when God's message came to him while he was still in Israel, that God would relent. One author describes Jonah's heart in this way. That God being gracious, merciful, long-suffering, full of loving kindness, and ready to stay his hand in judgment upon repentance, would spare the city of Nineveh if she would turn to the Lord. Without shame, Jonah lays bare the motivating impulses of his heart, which were despicable. Man cannot bear the grace of God to others. In his despondency and chagrin, he justifies his flight and quarrels with God because he spared Nineveh. Verses 3 and 4. Therefore now, O Yahweh, please take my life from me, for death is better for me than life. Yahweh said, Do you have good reason to be angry? The grace that God displayed with, Nineveh, with Jonah is noteworthy. God responded to Jonah with a gentle, simple question. There was no word of rebuke or punishment. God was seeking out Jonah's heart so that Jonah could bring light to his anger and displeasure. Did he have true and reasonable grounds for his anger? Jonah has a merciless attitude throughout the book. You can see his dreadful attitude in the beginning and you can read it Read how unfortunate it is at the end. He wanted to be killed the first time in chapter 1, verse 12, when he asked the sailors to throw him into the sea. He wanted to die so he wouldn't have to go to Nineveh. The Lord, the Lord didn't let it happen. Jonah survived. Now he's in Nineveh and wants to die again. Verse 5, Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it, There he made shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what happened in the city. See what would happen in the city. Jonah was so distraught over God's grace to this barbarian nation that he would rather be dead than see these people converted to God. Here is what he hoped for. That he would preach destruction, leave the city, go on a hill, wait 40 days, and watch the annihilation of Nineveh and love every minute of it. We don't have any idea how long Jonah sat in this shelter. Many would say that due to Jonah's extreme anger and his wish to die, that the 40 days had expired. Jonah had no means of knowing the reality of the repentance of Nineveh, but he was hoping that God would change his purpose concerning the city. Jonah was wanting a front row seat to watch and to hope for the best. And the best to him is that all of Nineveh be killed. Jonah was hoping that their repentance was not real and he could just sit there and watch God destroy them all. Verse 6, 
So the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort and Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. The plant grew very rapidly and had large leaves. The plant and its shade caused Jonah and it to be exceedingly glad. Here is the only place in the book that Jonah displayed gladness. And it appeared to be a selfish joy because of the comfort brought about by the plant. And he's out there. One author says he's out there and it's hot and it's in the part of the world that can be blazing hot. He builds a little shelter that is not adequate. So the Lord God, and he says, I love this verse, appointed a plant and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. I mean, this is grace upon grace upon grace for somebody who hasn't earned anything He's got extreme heat exposure. He's going to sit there until judgment falls. He thinks and hopes that they, they are, all get destroyed. God adds to his comfort so that he, he's not burned by the sun. And he's very happy. Verses 7 and 8. God created a plant and then he created a worm. God appointed a worm... So when dawn came the next day, it attacked the plant and withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die. This is the third time that he wanted to die. The sudden withering of the plant put Jonah back into the hot baking sun. And to add to his misery, God sent a hot, humid wind. Amid, amid his faint condition, Jonah again pleads with God for death. Verse 9, Then God said to Jonah, Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry even to death. Then Yahweh said, You had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and their left hand, as well as many animals? God again asked Jonah about having good reason to be angry, and Jonah replied with a passionate and intense ma in an passionate and intense an manner. It is evident from verse 10 that the plant was the object of a huge lesson for Jonah. Jonah was told, by, was told by God he had become attached to the plant because it served him and gratified his desires. Also in verse 10, those who cannot discern between the right hand and the left hand is interpreted to be children. We see God's tenderness in his mention of many animals. Many, we see God's tenderness in his mention of many animals in Nineveh. God had set forth all his love for his creatures, even cattle. So with this, the book abruptly ends. And one commentator adds that the close, the close of the book is intentional and much more forceful than if the thought had been carried out in further detail. The true climax of the thought of the pro prophecy has been reached and the all-important message of the book is left to the reader. The tender voice of God is telling forth the love of God for all the nations, for all his needy creatures. So what is the heart of the book of Jonah? Some would say this is the greatest missionary book in the Old Testament. The book was written to reveal the heart of a servant of God whose heart was not influenced by God's passion for the lost. So I have a couple of questions for us. Does this touch our hearts? Are we more interested in the comfort than in our comfort than the need to reach the lost? Are we all about the comforts of our own homes rather than to see the message of Christ to go out to the ends of the earth? Are we making it possible for all to hear his grace and power to save sinners? If all of Nineveh will repent over the preaching of a reluctant prophet with a bad attitude, they're going to be better off in eternity than the Pharisees 
who wouldn't repent even though the Lord Jesus came in person to be among them. Another author's viewpoint is this. Surprisingly, the only person in the story who resists God is Jonah. Sailors don't resist God. Ninevites don't resist God. Only the prophet of God. You just really are convinced that God ought to get somebody else. But God is in the business of doing mighty, massive work through people that from a human viewpoint would be discarded. And that should be encouraging to all of us because we're all flawed. So what are we, what are we to see in this book? God as the sovereign creator creates. He's sovereign over all things. God who has the power over creation. Even the pagan sailors recognize God as creator. Second, we learn that God is a supreme judge. The message that Jonah has uh, to give was the message of judgment. Forty days in Nineveh would be destroyed by divine fury and divine wrath. Recognizing their doom was imminent, imminent by God's grace, the Ninevites repented. The third element that we learn is that God is a gracious Savior. His loving kindness and compassion and grace is not limited to so-called good people or by our prejudices or indifferences, but is also extended to brutal, murderous, idolatrous pagans of his choosing. Those three choose truths then are the heart of the gospel. God is the creator of us all and all of us have sinned against our creator. Wrath and judgment have been pronounced upon us but we have been given the gospel which offers us forgiveness through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You really see the gospel in the heart of God in the story of Jonah. The creator God sinned against, warns about judgment, judgment and fully forgives those who repent and embrace and embrace him. Father, thank you for the book of Jonah. Thank you for a God who is compassionate, forgiving, and willing to overlook many, many things. But through his willingness to save sinners like us, we are so grateful, Father. Thank you again for the blessings that are in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.